Hi, what's up? Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video that describes the events of the Siege of Makapan. This event followed the events at Murderf Massacre. And I have already done a video about that on my channel. You can just go under videos um, you'll find it there. This site links in with the Starkfontein Caves. In 1945, they found a skull here that dates back to when um, humans first inhabited Southern and Eastern Africa, the Australopithecus Africanus. Now the Australopithecus Africanus, those were the predecessors of Homo habilis, and then you got Homo erectus, and then you got Homo sapiens. Now the correct way to address Chief Mokopane is Jose Holo Mokopane. For the purpose of this video, I'm just going to refer to him as Chief Mokopane. And by that, I do not mean any disrespect to any of the royal families. So this is where Hosi Mukombane, or better known as Chief Mokopane, came to hide away. Came here with his whole Kakana tribe, the livestock and the food supplies. Big Potgitter got together a commando. The women and children were left a safe distance away at Dwering Dry Dam. That's a few kilometers north of Mokopong or Nabum Spreit. The commando consisted of 70 Boers as well as 300 Ghatla allies. The Ghatlas, they were a Chana tribe from the Mahalisberg area. They decided to confront Mokopani first because of his location in the valley. At the caves, another 70 men from the Sertpansberg area joined the commando. So in total it was about 450 men. Mokopani would often use the cave to hide away from his enemies. Members of his tribe got sick because of histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis is a cave sickness. Um, it's an infection caused by a fungus that um, is um, in bird and bat droppings. The highest concentration can be found in a ficus cave. People with a weak immune system are more susceptible to this disease. Um, symptoms include weight loss, headaches, seizures. The commander arrived at Mokpone's home state. They found it abandoned. They burned down the fields so that there would not be no, no food supply and they came here. During 1853 and 1854 it was very dry in the Transvaal area. They then came to the caves and set up camp here at the foothill of the mountain and the siege started on 25th October 1854. That same day the Boos tried to storm the caves. The hills are steep and this turned out to be quite difficult. On the hill the commander found the four wagons and the oxen belonged to the murdered victims. They took the wagons and oxen and under heavy gunfire managed to get it down the hill. The commander realized that this is going to be a much more difficult process than initially anticipated. This was actually also the site where lime works was mined back in 1910. And just as you entered at the gate, there is a beautiful Victorian house and the lime rendering can still be seen on the walls today. So just by the way, they used to mine gold in the caves in the late 1800s. Now this links in with the Eerstling monument and the gold mining operations in the Nkumpi Valley. I have done a video on that, please go and check it out. This site is located just over this hill. 
Now today most of the cavities roofs has fallen in and the openings are very tight. But there is one cave, the peppercorn cave, which they are still mining. The commando kept a watchful eye over the stream to make sure the Kikana does not have a water supply. Some of the livestock, probably goats, were inside the cave to serve as food, but most were probably left outside. Driven by first, some animals did deep escape. There are two huge openings to the cave system. The Kikana fortified the entrances and they were armed with their sachais and guns. Behind these walls they waited for the commando. Some of the tactics that the commander tried was to smoke the Kikana out by making huge fires at the entrances. This didn't work. They also tried explosives and this didn't work as well. The steep hills made a full on attack very difficult. All they could do was to guard the caves and waiting for Chief Mokopani to come out. On the 6th of November 1854, 12 days after the siege had started, Piet Portgieter was close to one of the entrances when one of Mokopani's snipers shot him. Heavy gunfire was exchanged while his body was being retrieved. The first group of Kikane burst out of the cave. Two nights later, another large group stormed out of the cave. Among these escapees were Chief Mokopani, who got away undetected. A number of them were shot, but a number of them did make it to safety. These escapees got together at Chief Marawa and Chief Zebedila for safety. Chief Marawa was also looking after Chief Mokopani's cattle, some of his cattle for him. The commander went to the cave and in the language of the Ndebele, was up. Remember they were only after the chiefs and not the tribes. Over the next 10 days, small groups and individuals continued to abandon the cave. In total, 170 Kikana. Until finally, after being trapped for 24 days, the last 364 Kikana gave themselves over to the commando on 17 November 1854. They entered the caves and find a number of decomposing bodies at the entrance and inside the cave. Chief Mokopani was not in the cave. They did however find ammunition and guns and two wooden chests of clothing and other personal items that belonged to the victims at Moordrift. The commander laid claim to an unknown number of cattle, which was divided between the Ghatla and the Buru members of the commando. One of the Kikana men took the commando to a cave closer to Chief Mokopani's homestead, where the elephant thief were concealed. Now these thieves weren't only from the Moor Drift victims, um, these were looted from numerous attacks. In total, 23 big and 15 smaller tusks were found. The commander left the valley on the 21st of November 1854. Now these Kikana that was left in the cave after the majority escaped that night probably thought that the others would come and um, rescue them but when they realized this is not going to happen they gave themselves over. If only Chief Mokopani would have kept a diary we would have known what it was like those 30 days inside the cave and what the discussions were like. The Kikana returned to the homestead with what they had left. Some of the people that were infected with histoplasmosis continued to get sick and die when they were already back at the homestead. The symptoms of histoplasmosis can appear anything from 3 to 17 days after exposure and the last group would have been very susceptible to this. According to a thesis I read, prior to the siege Mokopane would have invoked the ancestors with the help of Sangoma. This would have ensured the protection for the people when they were inside the cave. According to the evidence, it is clear that Chief Mokopani's action did not prevent this from happening. It was ultimately his responsibility to ensure the well-being of his tribe. After the siege, Chief Mokopani's ability to talk to the ancestors on behalf of the group and cleanse them would have been important. The spirit and ability, however, in this regard, may have been severely compromised by the major loss of people and livestock. The fact that it did not rain during the siege 
would have been a sign from the ancestors that they were not pleased. If it did happen to rain, the Kumanu would have been forced to abandon the siege and the Kikana could have left the cave. Now failure to meet appropriate steps to claims and gone as spiritual protection could lead to further misfortune and even death. Later on, in early of 1855, Khosi Bukombane committed suicide by drinking poison. He was buried at his homestead and his tombstone is still there today. Now while Chief Mokopani fled to the caves, Chief Mongkopani, he gathered his Langa tribe and fled to the opposite direction, west, to a hill called Mamatlakala. Now this was an excellent natural defense to hide out. It's a small hill with straight cliffs, very high and a flat plateau. Attacks by enemies could have only been possible by a north by a northeastern side. The commander realized that to get the Langa off the hill would result in another long siege and they were not up for it. It was decided that only a small commander would be sent out to scout the hill. This did result in a small scrimmage where a few Langa men were shot and the cattle were confiscated. Obviously a cattle was left at the foot hill and these people were probably herding them. The commander returned to Fotani Hill where they destroyed Mankopani's crawl and the fields of the Langa. The remains of the hunting party that was murdered nearby was buried there. A number of these cattle had a lung disease and needed to be shot with fear that they would infect the others. Some of the cattle was given to the widows of the two farmers that was murdered and the other cattle were divided between the Boer and the Khatla people of the commando. After that, Chief Mankopani saw an uh, enemy in every white person and every black person that was on friendly terms with them. During December of 1854, a highly contagious bovine pneumonia broke out and um, a lot of cattle died. These, this epidemic also broke out amongst the tribes of Dendebele and a lot of people died. With time, the survivors would have merged with um, other Ndebele and Sutu tribes. The town that was planned to be built in the valley the following year got the name Potgietersres in memory of Piet Potgieter that died here at the siege. After 1994, the town was renamed to Mokopane. This name change serves as a symbolic monument to commemorate Chief Mokopane and his tribe. And to reconcile, me respect that. In 2005, this monument was erected at the cave. Can this be described as a victory for the Afrikaner? No, this wasn't a battle. This was merely a sequence of events that led to two tragic ancient incidents that makes part of our South African history. Now, oral accounts and past experiences compel people to speak from two places at once, the present and then the world as we remember it that needs to be reenacted in the present. Now, very often, Selective memory or even false memory enables group of people or even individuals to live in and even cope with reality. Now deep-rooted belief in the contaminating effect of death were present in the Ndebele. They are polluted and it extends to relatives, material objects as well as food. It was believed that if a person is not buried with the necessary rights, they would not be able to enter the world of the ancestors. Now these spirits would have wanted their living descendants until appeased through some kind of sacrifice. In other ethnic groups, however, it was custom to only bury the chief and not the commoners of the tribe. The commoners were left outside for scavengers. Now after looking at these two incidents and evaluating the evidence out of my democratic South African point of view, I think we can call it quits. You will never know how many of the forces were killed in the valley in the years. You will never know how many people died in the cave during the siege. But we can, however, understand the situation. And at least now in 2020, 106 years later, we have the knowledge of knowing better. There's no reason to make history so complicated when life was so simple. Today I will lay these lilies in memory of every Kikana that died here during the siege. May their souls rest in peace for eternity onwards. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like and I will see you in the next one.